then the title, this title is Modular Representation Theory of Symmetric Groups. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I just uh, realized that uh, this talk will be considered as a gentle introduction to the talk by John Brandon and to the talk by Eric Bessero, uh, which have already happened, but that might be just as well because I think the closer it is to the drinking time, the more basic the talk should become. So. Uh, I will talk about uh, representation theory of symmetry groups, um, um, specifically modular representation theory of symmetry groups, that is uh, representation theory of symmetry groups of a field's positive characteristic. Uh, it is, of course, not as well understood as the ordinary representation theory, but recently there has been some interesting developments, uh, and the goal of this talk is to review some of them. Uh, so these developments reveal some uh, uh, interesting connections, yeah, interesting and fairly deep connections to Lie theory and other areas. Um, so, um, whenever, po I, I, whenever possible, I opted for more basic objects. So, if there is a choice between Hecke algebra, for example, a symmetric group, I will always opt for symmetric group. Uh, but uh, as you have already seen, this this theory is, of course, a part of much much more broad, a broadly developed theory by now. But so we will we'll proceed in as basic way as possible. So, to fix notation. Uh, uh, F will be the ground field of arbitrary characteristic, but I will only say something maybe interesting for the case where P is positive. Uh, and sigma A will be the symmetry group on n letters. Um, in fact, we won't see this notation very much because from the very beginning I want to introduce the group algebra Hn, and the goal is to, uh, to understand or to say something interesting about Hn modules, specifically finding them, uh, specifically irreducible Hn modules. Of course, asymmetric groups come in a family. Uh, they are naturally embedded, where Sn minus 1 is embedded in Sn, where permutations of the first n minus 1 uh, on the first n minus 1 letters, and so that gives us the embeddings of the group algebras. And uh, it is a well known idea that it makes sense to consider all of these representations together, because in this way we can naturally take into account the relations between representation theories of symmetric groups of different sizes which come from induction and restriction operators. And so one uh, uh, natural way of taking this into account is in the form of a branching graph. So this is a graph which is defined purely representation theoretically. Uh, this is a graph which I will denote by BP. It depends on the characteristic of the ground field P. And its vertices are just the isomorphism classes of the irreducible HN modules. So these are all irreducible representations of, of all symmetric groups. And edges are defined in a very natural way. It's actually a directed graph. And uh, if L is an irreducible HN minus 1 module and M is an irreducible HN module, then we draw an arrow from L to M if and only if L is a submodule uh, of the restriction from HN to HN minus 1. In fact, you can say that if it appears as a submodule several times, then you draw several arrows, but this is not going to happen. So it's just going to be part of the statement. Okay, okay so for example, uh, if you're interested in B2, uh, then it, of course, it goes forever to the right, but it begins as follows. Uh, so you can ignore the numbers in the circles. It's not part of the data. Uh, it's just for fun. So these are the dimensions of the corresponding irreducible representations. And so each circle is an irreducible module, and each arrow is defined according to this rule. Uh, in fact, it turns out that it, it makes sense to carry a little bit more information. There is more information which uh, comes in nature. Right? Namely, if you consider the so-called nth Murphy element, which by definition is just the sum of all transpositions which end on n, that's an element of the group algebra. Uh, then the first uh, very easy observation is that xn commutes with the smaller symmetry group, hn minus 1. And also it's not hard to establish by induction on n uh, that uh, uh, the possible eigenvalues of xn in, an, in a module of a symmetry group are not arbitrary, but in fact they, they are restricted, they are all more or less integers. In fact, integers times uh, identity in our field, which is real integers of characteristic E0, or integers modular P, could be identified with integers modular P if P is positive. And I will denote this set of integers by I. So this I is the set of all possible eigenvalues for now, but it will also play a different role later on, so that's an important piece of notation. Uh, now, uh, if I take an HN module, and I consider the, they don't have to act semi-simply, so I, ha I have to consider the generalized I eigenvalue for I possible eigen, uh, uh, I, I pick a possible eigenvalue, I consider the generalized I eigenspace for Xn acting on V, corresponding to the eigenvalue I, and because uh, 
Xn can mix with Hn minus 1, this is Hn minus 1 stable. So that gives us a submodule of the restriction, and in fact, uh, in this way we can define um, a refinement of restriction, uh, which is called I restriction functor, which goes from Hn to Hn minus 1. So Ei is, is this functor, it's exact, and uh, restriction decomposes as a direct sum of these Eis. Of course, sometimes Ei could be 0, this is okay. Um, and so now uh, we can upgrade this BP to actually a colored graph, uh, where uh, it's the same graph as before, but now we are going to color the arrows, and the arrow from L to M is going to be of color I, exactly if, uh, or there's going to be an arrow of color I, if and only if L is a subset not just of restriction, but of restriction of the I restriction, the I M, this refined direct sum. Uh, so for example, B2 looked like this before, and if you upgrade it, to look like this. And um, a fundamental result in characteristic, uh, in characteristic zero representation theory for symmetric groups, which goes back to Shore, uh, is uh, that uh, there is a unique isomorphism of color directed graphs uh, between this graph B0, which is representation theory, and the graph Y0, which is combinatorics. Uh, so this Y0 is the young graph, and uh, it's defined as follows its vertices are all young diagrams. And its edges are defined as follows. There is an edge of color i from the young diagram mu to the young diagram lambda, if and only if we can obtain lambda from mu by adding a box of color i. So for, uh, for it, it begins like this, and I only have to tell you what the colors of the boxes are, and those are the diagonal numbers. So the main diagonal boxes are labeled with color 0, and then 1, 2, and so on. So you can see that uh, these are the integers, and um, they have to be integers because this is what the set i is uh, in for the case of characteristic zero. Um, in fact, uh, there is a similar theorem in characteristic p, uh, which I proved about 20 years ago, and it sounds in exactly the same way. So there is a unique isomorphism of color directed graphs between dp, which is representation theory of symmetric group and characteristic p, and yp, which is combinatorics. Uh, so here yp is the p modulator graph, which I have defined, and um, Okay, so its vertices are easy to describe. Uh, its vertices are not all young diagrams, but the so-called peristictic young diagrams, that is, these uh, di young diagrams of the partitions lambda, with parts lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on, uh, such that the consecutive differences are less than p. Uh, and the edges are interesting, but I'm not going to tell you what they are. So instead, instead I will tell you something else. There is, there is a delicate uh, rule which tells you uh, when there is an edge, uh, instead, first of all, I will show you an example. Uh, so this is what B2 looked like as an abstract representation theoretic graph. Uh, and uh, Y2 is going to look like this. So if you are quick, you can see maybe that it, at least it starts as the same graph. Uh, so there is a similar, uh, similar rule. You can add a box of color 0. Now the colors are, um, um, of course, modular P, because we are working modular P. So this is Y2. So this is 0 and 1. Uh, but the rule for when you can add a box of color zero and which exactly box of color zero, now there could be many options you can add. Uh, th this, is, this is a subtle rule which is not going to be important for this talk, so I'm going to skip this combinatorics. It's explicit but rather subtle. Uh, so all, all that's important for us is that it's subtle somehow. Because uh, uh, and next I want to go to the thing which I want to call a LLT relation or Las Cooley Clarity Boundary relation, um, which uh, um, have observed that this, uh, this uh, p modular young graph, yp, which is this p modular combinatorics that I have alluded to, uh, is, uh, has appeared in another area of mathematics, in a completely different area of mathematics, more or less. Uh, it, is all, it is at the same time the crystal graph of the basic representation of certain quantized enveloping algebra. Uh, in fact, it's a quantized enveloping algebra of the Katzmuth algebra G, uh, which is a fine uh, Lie algebra SLP hat. So observe that this P, which was characteristic of the ground field, now becomes the rank of this Lie algebra. And also observe that this, uh, uh, that this, this um, crystal graph or crystal is something which, uh, in a natural way, only the quantum group can see. OK, so uh, first comment is that this result is purely combinatorial. Yp, which I didn't tell you what it was, but I told you that there is some explicit combinatorial rule is compared to an explicit combinatorial description of the crystal graph, which is due to Mr. and and you can see that the two are equivalent. And uh, on the other hand, uh, it could, uh, you could see from the subtlety of both 
uh, from the subtlety of the commentary which is involved that it can hardly be a coincidence. Somehow it was very stunning that uh, this immediately indicated that there should be close relations between these objects. And so the questions which uh, immediately arise are why, uh, what do representations of symmetry group uh, in characteristic P have to do with uh, this affine Lie algebra? Um, uh, why is there a quantum group more specifically? Because crystal graph is basically a quantum group object. And uh, what are some other situations like that? And I think that basically we can say that today we understand the answers to all these questions, although this depends a little bit on what we understand by the word understand. So, but but I, I, I'm going to I'm going to uh, yeah, I'm going to explain something. Uh, so so far the comments are that this Kaiser uh, algebra has Dintin diagram, which is just a cycle, and observe that this Dintin diagram has vertices which are again labeled by the set i, which before was the set of eigenvalues. Now that it, it is also going to be, we are not going to distinguish between the two, it is going to be the set of vertices of the Dintin diagram. Um, um, this is an equivalent data. data. This Dintin diagram is the same as Lee theoretic Cartan matrix, which comes with generalized Cartan matrix. Uh, in the Katz notation, this is type Lee type AP minus 1 of 1. Um, and finally, the basic module is the one which corresponds to the fundamental dominant weight lambda zero, which in turn corresponds to this affine vertex zero. Okay, so uh, in order to move on, uh, I, need, uh, I need to uh, consider some other rather basic things about the symmetry group. Remember that we have this Murphy element xn, which is the sum of all transpositions which end on n. But of course, there is xn minus one, xn minus two, and so on. Um, uh, so there is this family of Murphy elements. Xi is all transpositions which have an i. And uh, I told you that uh, Xn commutes with Hn minus 1, so it commutes with all of these, and so all of these guys commute. So this, uh, this is an important family of commuting elements. And uh, for any finite dimensional Hn module, we can now consider uh, a generalized, simultaneous generalized eigenspace. So the way to do this is we pick an eigenvalue i1 for x1, i2 for x2, and so on, i n for xn. So these are going to be the tuples in i to the n, which appeared in other talks. Um, and um, the corresponding, I'd like to say i weight space, but maybe it's better to say i word space, because this is not a weight, but a word. So the corresponding i word space is just the simultaneous generalized eigenspace uh, for this commuting family of elements on v. And of course, v decomposes as a direct sum of word spaces. Um, and then uh, another simple observation is the following. Uh, by applying this basically to the regular representation, you can easily deduce it's a piece of general nonsense uh, that the algebra HN possesses the idempotence, uh, the word idempotence, which project to the weight spaces. In fact, this is a char characterizing property of this idempotence. Uh, so for every word i, there exists a, uh, an idempotent 1 sub i um, called e sub i in other talks. Uh, such that uh, uh, their orthogonal sum to 1 and their defining property is that 1 sub i v is this uh, i word space. Uh, some of this could be 0, but 0 is an item point. Okay, so now symmetric group acts on the words just by place permutation, by permitting the entries. Uh, consider the set of orbits, i m uh, modulus sigma n. Let's fix an orbit alpha and let's define an another item important, 1 alpha which is just the same sum of this word of importance when i runs over a fixed orbit. Uh, then it is easy to see that, uh, okay, it could still be zero because this one sub i could be zero. Everybody in the orbit could be zero. But when it's not zero, it's a central i important. In fact, it's even better. It's a primitive central i important always. Um, and so if you multiply the group algebra by this primitive central i important, we'll get exactly the block, O zero. So these h alphas, are exactly the blocks or zeros of the group algebra HN. And the algebra HN decomposes as a direct sum of these blocks, and these blocks are indecomposable, indecomposable to side it. So in fact, representation theory of HN, uh, well, to study it, it's the same as to study representation theory of these blocks, H alpha. In fact, this is even better. OK, so and a little technical comment. If I have an element, some standard element of HN, uh, and I want to consider the corresponding element 1 alpha times x of the block, I will usually just begin to denote it by x. OK, so one way, one first way, perhaps, or something that should be the first way, although historically it wasn't the first way, 
to explain connections of representation theory symmetry groups in characteristic P to Lie theory, specifically to Lie theory of this affine Lie type, uh, is to say that uh, these blocks H alpha of the group algebra of the symmetry group are isomorphic to Havana flower de Rocky algebras of the corresponding Lie type, or um, also known as Kuber Hecke algebras. I mentioned like that in other talks. So, um, let me, uh, let me uh, uh, give you a little bit more details about this result, which has been mentioned in other talks. So, uh, Havana flower de Rocky algebras are given by generators and relations, and actually, I'm going to tell you what the corresponding generators are in the, um, in the group algebra of the symmetric group are. So, first of all, there will, be, there will be three kinds of generators, and the first family of generators will be the side importance, which I have already introduced. Now, if you want to write them down explicitly in terms of Coxter generators, you have to work a little bit hard, but uh, it, it doesn't really matter what they are. It's, it's, it's important that they, they exist, and you can write down explicit formulas, but that's not the point. So, there will be the side importance. There will also be the elements which are called YT and the elements which are called Psi R, and I will tell you what those are at least to some extent. YTs are very easy, they, they are defined by this formula, they are essentially just Murphy elements. The only thing that happens here is that on the eigenpotence 1i, you subtract the eigenvalue ir, which really means that if in representation, if in certain representation, <coughs> xt acts with certain German blocks, we just subtract the eigenvalues on the main diagonal, and we make all of these nilpotent. So these YTs are going to be nilpotent elements. So they're sort of nilpotentized Murphy elements. This is, this is not very important. Uh, the, so the y's are essentially the xt's. And the psi r's are a little bit more interesting, and their main property is as follows. Um, you know, you want uh, to act uh, uh, on these word spaces, uh, just, uh, you, you, would, you would like, you would like sr, so psi r is sort of like sr, simple transposition, or the Coxter, the Coxter generator. But uh, one, one um, property which this SR does not satisfy is that when you act with SR on the word space, you don't arrive to another word space. You would like sort of this uh, uh, group to act uh, as while group in representations of a Lie algebra. You would like while group to permute the word spaces of A spaces, but this SR doesn't do it. It actually takes you to the right word space, which is obtained from I by multiplying with SR, that is permuting IR and IR plus one, plus something in the original word space. So you need to adjust it. And in order to adjust it, you take certain polynomials in PRs and QRs, which in fact are not chosen uniquely, they just have to satisfy certain properties. And there is a way to choose them uh, in such a way so that these psi Rs will, will, will just act as intercliners on the word spaces. So they, they will permute the word spaces as expected. And there is a way to do this, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. So um, uh, next. Uh, um, in order to write the relations, not the generators, so this is the, just the generators, to write down the relations, you pick certain very simple polynomials, usually they're going to be just linear, or scalars, so zero. You know, if characteristic is bigger than two, then this CIJ could only be negative one, so at worst they're, they're, they're linear. <coughs> and there is some choice of signs which is made here, which again is not arbitrary, but there is a lot of choices, essentially one for every orientation of the Dinkin diagram. And with this notation, uh, the theorem uh, that I want uh, uh, to, to, to say next is that this algebra H alpha is generated uh, by this new set of generators, subject only to the following relations, which you have already seen, maybe once or twice. Uh, and in fact, again, in my talk, it's not going to be, again, very important what they are. Um, you can see what's sort of going on. The first family of relations says, for example, that the side importance are right importance that they are orthogonal to each other and some to identity. And then there are various relations which tell you more or less how to move any generator past any generator. There are these bogus uh, uh, um, braid relations with some, uh, with some error term, uh, which is actually some sort of divided difference derivative, so it's always a polynomial in voice. Uh, quite often it is zero. And uh, maybe I will just mention this relation. It's a cyclotomic relation which has also appeared in other talks. And this is a relation which basically makes all these y's nilipotent. If you don't put this relation in, they will be algebraically independent and the algebra will be infinite dimensional. So um, that's the presentation of any block uh, of um, any block H alpha of the group algebra of the symmetry group. And um, one further comment uh, that is due here is that uh, this polynomial Q, uh, which where these easy polynomials, 
This is where the lead type comes in. Comes in. This is essentially the only place where it comes in. So this depends on the Cartan lead chips. As does another important uh, uh, information which arises from this result, uh, namely that uh, this presentation allows us to introduce a non-trivial Z grading on the blocks H alpha of the group algebra of the symmetry group, which is extremely difficult to see from the point of view of a Cox representation. So it's kind of a well-hidden grading. And uh, um, this gradient is defined on the generators by putting the idempotence of cos into degree 0, y into degree 2, and psi r times an idempotent are put into these, uh, again, Cartan integers. So this is again determined by, by, by means of least theta. Okay, so from now on, in fact, whenever I will talk about modules over, over the symmetry group, I will always speak of the graded modules, and I claim that uh, by doing so, we are not changing the topic of conversation because of course, we are interested in the irreducible modules, and the irreducible modules over a finite dimensional degraded algebra are automatically gradable, and in fact, in a unique way, up to isomorphism and degree shift. So, uh, uh, in fact, we, we are not changing the topic of conversation, instead, we are getting some additional insight. There is this hidden gradient which is around, which we didn't know about before. Uh, and in fact, this gradient also appearance, uh, uh, explains, in some sense, uh, the appearance of the quantum group. Okay, so to present further connections to Lie theory, uh, I want some very standard Lie theoretic notation. Uh, namely, uh, together with the Cartan matrix of the Dinkin diagram, there come standard Lie theoretic pieces of data, simple roots alpha i, fundamental dominant, the corresponding fundamental dominant weights lambda i, as in the Katz notation, um, the normalized bilinear form with the following properties, uh, the positive part of the root lattice q plus. Uh, if I have an element, alpha of q plus, uh, then I will denote by height alpha the sum of the coefficients of alpha when expressed in terms of the, of the simple roots. Um, and finally, q of g will be the quantized enveloping algebra uh, of g over q of q, um, always of this fixed d type in this <coughs> form, uh, with the standard Chevalier generators, which I will denote now by capitals as opposed to the lowercase letters. Uh, and finally, V of lambda zero will be the reducible module with highest weight lambda zero and fixed highest weight vector B plus. Um, I also want to make a little notational switch. I want to observe that the orbits of the symmetric group on uh, the tuples uh, of vertices of the Dinkin diagram are in one-to-one -one correspondence with an element of Q plus of height alpha. So this bijection is simply you take an orbit of the word I1 dot the dot I n and you send it to the sum of simple roots alpha i1 plus the dot plus alpha i n. So I'm going to switch gears here, and I'm not going to talk about these orbits anymore. I'm just going to talk about elements alpha of q plus. So for every alpha of q plus, we have this block algebra h alpha of, this, of the group algebra of the symmetric group. And uh, the i restriction functors, as is easy to see, they uh, lower alpha by alpha i. So really, e i is an exact functor which goes from alpha i plus alpha i from alpha plus alpha i to h alpha modules. And uh, there is a similar functor fi which is defined using conduction instead of restriction, which goes in the opposite direction and is bijoint. Uh, this is again bogus. Uh, basically, we are going to introduce certain degree shift functor, but um, um, so I take any module m of h alpha and I'm going to shift the degree. So this notation q to the n m means that we are going to shift the gradient on the module up by m. So that, and then we are going to shift by this specific uh, number, which is prescribed by this theory. Um, finally, we are going again to consider the growth in D group uh, of H alpha modules for all alpha and Q plus. So this, this is again a uh, representation theory of all symmetric groups taken together. Um, and I want to observe that because of the gradient, this group is not just an abelian group, but it's naturally actually a ZQ inverse module, uh, where the action of the variable Q comes from uh, um, the shift from the degree shift, and that's why this notation is convenient. So here it means the degree shift, the class of the module with, with the shift of degree, this is, this is multiplication. Okay, so uh, these exact functors EI, FI, and this kind of bogus degree shift KI, which I have introduced, they induce, because they're exact, they induce um, ZQQ linear endomorphisms which will be denoted with capital letters E, I, F, I, and K, I plus minus 1 on this growth in the group. And uh, um, 
uh, the theorem is that these operators uh, on the growth and degroup when they extend scalars to the field um, satisfy the defining relations of the Chevalier generators of this uh, quantized envelopment algebra. So this, this result goes back to the original paper of Las Cooley, Fiore, Tibon, and was used by many people and extended to very many directions by very many people. I will, I will mention some of them. Um, so um, uh, for the graded case, we checked it with, 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 with Brandon first time. Um, so this really shows that this growth and group becomes a module over this quantized envelopment algebra. Uh, and in fact, this module is easy to identify. In fact, it's isomorphic to V of lambda zero, and this isomorphism is explicit and, 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 and unique. If you, insi if you, if you insist uh, that the trivial H zero module and H zero by convention is just a copy of the field F, and it has only one module F, uh, that has to go to the highest grade vector. And you can say much more, I'll just say a couple of things. Uh, under this isomorphism, the weight spaces correspond exactly to the blocks. You see H. Uh, is naturally some of these blocks. V is naturally some of the weight spaces. So this 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 um, um, this result respects these decompositions. And finally, the basis which uh, the, the basis on the Grothian group, um, which comes from the simple modules, um, is uh, um, a perfect basis of V of lambda zero in the sense of Bernstein and Kasdan. And in a second, I'm going to unpack this. I'm going to unpack this statement a little bit. So this this is a bunch of properties. Um, and I just want to mention before that, that there is lots and lots of various generalizations of that, and you have seen uh, maybe 30% of all possible generalizations in the other two talks that, that you have seen before, but, but this is a big industry now. Okay, so now let me, let me unpack the, the, the fact three about the perfect basis, because it could be stated in, in, in terms of certain branching rules. In fact, it could be it's, uh, these branching rules, which I will show you, imply this statement, but they, they, they are a little bit stronger, but, but not by much. Uh, so if I take an H alpha module, let me define by epsilon i of m uh, the maximum of times that I can apply the functor ei before I get zero. And similarly, phi i in terms of the fi's. Um, uh, this is the usual statistics on the crystal graph, which can be defined also in terms of the crystal operators, although it's not quite clear from this definition yet. Uh, but it will become clear after, after, after this term. So, uh, the theorem that I want to explain is the following. So, um, for uh, let's fix alpha, let's fix i, and let's fix an irreducible module L. So that's an irreducible module with some symmetric group, more specifically in the alpha block. Uh, so then, uh, when we apply the functor ei or the functor fi, we always get either zero, it's possible, or we get an indecomposable module. But in fact, it's much better than that. You, also, you always get a module with a simple socal and head. So there is always a uh, an irreducible H alpha minus alpha I module, which I will denote EI tilde of L, because this is a crystal operator, and turns out that this exactly recovers the crystal graph, uh, with the properties that the socle of EIL is a specific shift of this module, and the head of EIL is another specific sh shift of this module. So, so this 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 simple this simple socle, in fact, you can you can you can take care of, of the degrees with which it appears with the with, 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 with the shifts. Um, similar result for fi is exactly the same, but just dual. And moreover, you can say how many times this module will appear. And this is a graded multiplicity, so that it takes into account the degree shifts. Uh, n square black brackets means just the usual quantum integer. And the multiplicity of this simple module, it doesn't have to appear just in the circle and the head. It could appear many times. And this multiplicity is exactly epsilon i of lambda, that, that statistics which I have introduced. Similar statement for fi. Um, then epsilon i of e i of lambda, of e i tilde of lambda, is one less than epsilon i of l, and for all other composition factors, it is yet smaller. So this is part of the statement about the perfect basis. And similarly for, for f i's. So from this you can deduce that in fact, um, uh, epsilon i is something that you can read off the crystal graph, because it's not just the maximal number of e i's that you can apply, it's also the num maximal number of e i tildes that you can apply. Um, again, a comment is that there are, there are many more results about branching, which in fact are probably even more useful than these ones uh, in many applications, but I will not go in that direction. Um, I will mention just one other thing, which also has been mentioned, but uh, you see here what, what basically happened historically was that we started from uh, representation theory of symmetry groups, and we've got some connections to E theory, but you can try to go backwards. 
you can start from the, your least iterative data, which we have, and you can try to see what kind of results you get for the symmetric group. And a good example comes from these joint k equivalences, because one thing that has, uh, that so far in, in what I was talking about, uh, one thing that wasn't interpreted was the action of the, of the affine wire group W of the, of the cuts with the algebra G on the weight space of V of lambda zero. Uh, so, so this group definitely acts on the weights and on the weight spaces. Uh, and in fact, uh, it acts by certain isometries on the weight spaces. And you can try to guess what it corresponds to in terms of representation theory. And uh, Chong Kukia's result, which is actually stronger than Breuer's abelian defect group conjecture, the generalization of that for the case of symmetry group, says that, uh, um, that this, this uh, being in the same orbit for two weights is equivalent uh, for two blocks to be direct equivalent. And in fact, you can even guess by looking at the least theory how to prove this theorem. Because, uh, um, First of all, it's very easy in one direction. You can see very easily that if the two weights are not in the same W orbit, then they have certain invariants which, which show that they could not be direct equivalent. For example, different dimensions of the growth integrators. Uh, but uh, in, in, uh, in the other direction, it's difficult because you basically need to lift the action of the, of the Y group to a direct equivalence. Uh, but you know the usual formula for the Y group action. In fact, it's enough to lift just the action of a simple reflection because every element is a product of simple reflections. And the usual formula for the simple reflection that you can find in any theory group is uh, x of ei times x of minus fi times x of ei. And if you write this uh, product of three exponents and you open up, you'll get certain, um, um, you'll get certain uh, plus minus linear combination of e to the i's, f to the j's, and e to the i's, and that, that linear plus minus linear combination will tell which complex to take. Uh, and this complex is going to establish, uh, this complex is going to, it turns out that this complex, they prove it, establishes a, a direct equivalence between the corresponding blocks. So that's an example of using this in the other direction. Okay, so uh, now uh, let me remind you again this theorem. Uh, um, I want to go in slightly different direction now. Let me remind you the theorem about uh, the presentation of the group algebra of the symmetry group in terms of this Havana flow of the Rookie presentation. Um, and remember that we had this relation, uh, this cyclotomic relation, which made the y's nilpotent. If you don't put this relation in, then the y's will be algebraically independent, although they will, of course, commute, so they will just form a polynomial sub there. So now let's do it. Let's drop this relation, and then we'll get certain infinite dimensional algebra, which is actually uh, Havana flow the Rokia algebra A alpha as defined originally. And that gives us, uh, of course, because we have one less relation, we have a natural subjection from this algebra to the algebra H alpha. And um, one other idea that I, I would like to try to sell, uh, which is probably obvious and known to many people, is that in some sense it is easier or maybe it is more appropriate to study representation theory of A alpha than representation theory of H alpha, even though this is a much bigger algebra. So first of all, uh, all reducible modules over H alpha, of course, inflate to A alpha. And so clearly, again, we're not changing the topic of conversation. If you understand uh, this situation, we will understand this situation. Uh, of course, A alpha has many more reducible modules, but that might be to the good because in some sense this could be uh, this algebra can see more. There are certain reducible modules that this algebra does not see. Um, this is all very naive, but uh, a less naive statement is that uh, somehow this representation theory of A alpha seems to be more rich and more natural. For example, it seems to have a much nicer homological properties. So this algebra uh, is uh, what's known to be cellular, while the algebra A alpha uh, is conjecturally um, and a fine quasi hereditary algebra. Equivalent statement to this is that the algebra of finitely generated modules, um, this, uh, this, uh, this algebra of finitely generated modules over this uh, infinite dimensional graded al algebra H A alpha uh, is what's called an affine highest weight category. So uh, it's possible that uh, McNamara's two week ago preprint contains a statement which is close to the proof of this, although it actually proves a little bit less than that, and it might turn out that a little bit less is actually uh, quite a bit less. So I, I don't quite understand how much more needs to be done in order to actually prove this. But but there is a recent advancement in this in this area, which 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 
probably gets, gets us rather close to this statement. So um, I'm not going to tell you what uh, exactly it is. So, so if, you, if you know what highest wave category is, and I think it has been mentioned a couple of times, then this is a certain generalization of that. And uh, this is a nice homological property of a category to have. Uh, in particular, these, these categories come, come with two kinds of standard modules. Um, the standard modules delta and the proper standard modules delta bar of pi. And uh, at least uh, in the end of this talk, I want to explain the construction of the standard modules delta bar of pi, together with the classification of uh, simple modules over here. Okay, so um, this uh, goes as follows. First of all, highest weight categories come with a partial order on the set of isoclasses of reducible modules. So I think in Brandon's talk it was some sort of a dominance order on the weights, and uh, here it's going to be a little bit different. So such an order here comes from picking a convex order on the positive roots. Uh, so let me give the necessary definition. So let phi plus be a set of positive roots for the Casimir algebra G. It's an infinite set, but in fact, uh, it splits nature into two kinds, into real positive roots and into imaginary positive roots. And imaginary positive roots are all multiples of the null of delta. So that's uh, the, the set of imaginary roots. And a convex preorder on phi plus is a preorder such that uh, first technical conditions. First of all, this says more or less it's a total preorder. Either beta is less than or equal to gamma or gamma is less than or equal to beta. And moreover, both hold which is possible for the preorder, but both hold if and only if uh, they are both imaginary. So basically all these imaginary rules is just one equivalence class. And secondly, the convexity condition proper says that uh, if beta plus gamma is a root, it has to be between beta and gamma. So if beta, gamma, and beta plus gamma are all positive roots, then beta plus gamma has to be always between beta and gamma. So uh, you, might be, uh, uh, you might be familiar with this notion uh, in the guise of reduced decomposition of the longest element of a wide group. So by result of Papi, uh, the, this uh, epic, uh, choice of a convex order on the positive roots in a finite type is equivalent to a choice of reduced decomposition of the longest element. Uh, but uh, of course there is no longest element in the fine, in the fine situation. So uh, it's more natural to work with the convex preorder on the positive roots, and in fact it's more natural on many, on, on many other counts. Okay, so then again, as has been mentioned, uh, there are natural uh, induction and restriction operators again on these um, uh, big KLR algebras, on these infinite dimensional algebras. In fact, it's more convenient to denote induction for me by just this little circle. So if M is H, uh, A alpha module, N is A beta module, then uh, we are going to denote induction like that. And uh, as usual, again, it is natural to study A alpha modules uh, by means of induction from smaller a betas. And uh, you can do it unless module is cuspidal. So this is again a standard thing. But we are going to need to induce uh, in a prescribed convex order. And we are, going, and we are going to try to get all the modules out of the modules which cannot be obtained by this way. So that's the notion of cuspidality. Uh, but in fact, uh, instead of uh, saying what cuspidal is um, in terms of induction, it's better to, to, to just apply Frobenius reciprocity, and it's more natural to define cuspidal in terms of restriction. So that's what I'm going to do in the next definition. So let alpha be a positive root. Uh, a finite dimensional A alpha module is called cuspidal if whenever restriction to beta gamma is not zero, but beta and gamma are arbitrary elements of Q plus. Of course, they have to sum to alpha. So if whenever restriction to beta gamma of M is not zero, then it follows that beta is a sum of roots which are less than alpha, and gamma is a sum of roots which are greater than alpha, sum of positive roots. And uh, the theorem uh, uh, on the classification of cuspidal modules is as follows. So it turns out that if alpha is a real root, then in fact there exists a unique after a isomorphism in degree shift cuspidal A alpha mod irreducible cuspidal A alpha module L alpha. I didn't assume that this module is irreducible, so this definition makes sense, but if we want to classify irreducible cuspidals, and it turns out that for real roots there is always a unique one, exactly one for one positive root. While for the imaginary root, uh, there is a whole family, it's, it, and it's, this situation is completely different from this situation on many counts. And in fact, this, this, uh, a, uh, this uh, imaginary uh, irreducible cuspidals are labeled by the multi-partition where 
uh, the set Pn of multipartitions is actually the set of P minus 1 multipartitions. So I, I don't say P minus 1 multipartitions because all multipartitions are going to be P minus 1 multipartitions. Where multipartition is what you think it is, it's a P minus 1 tuple of partitions so that the total sum of all boxes is n. So it will denote by Pn the set of all multipartitions and by P the set of all multipartitions of all n's. And now what we are going to try to do is we are going to try to induce from the cuspidals up. And we are going to do it always in a prescribed order. And so the data that we get is the following. Basically, we are going to have several real roots. And we collect, we collect the multiplicity here. And then uh, several real roots which are smaller. And then several real roots which are smaller. Then there will be imaginary part. And then there will be the real roots which are smaller than the imaginary. And so this gives us this data of root partition, or maybe better called custom partition, uh, where I just have a bunch of roots which appear in the decreasing order. I collected the multiplicities, they can appear several times, so it's weekly decreasing order if you prefer. And the only twist here is that instead of the imaginary one, I just insert this multipartition one. And uh, this is called the root partition of alpha if the sum of all of these is equal to alpha. Now alpha is an arbitrary element of Q plus this time. Okay, so let's denote by pi of alpha the set of all root partitions. Um, um, it comes with a natural order which is more or less lexicographic order or bilexicographic order um, induced by the convex order of Q plus that we have to pitch. So this is not that important. And then, again, given such a root partition, what we are going to do, we are just going to take those cuspidals and we are going to induce them up in the prescribed order. And uh, then the theorem is that for every root partition, we have this proper standard module delta bar of pi. It has an irreducible head. This uh, head could be called L of pi. Um, these L of pi's are exactly all irreducible modules, you know, complete in the redundant system of irreducible A alpha modules. And finally, uh, um, we have a union triangle decomposition matrix uh, for the delta bars in terms of these L's. Um, so, um, so I have about five minutes? Yes. OK, so in the remaining five minutes, let me tell you uh, um, a little bit more about um, the construction of the imaginary cuspidal model. So these, uh, these real cuspidal modules, of course, also have to be constructed. But since they are unique, it's already clear that, that they are canonical. While these L of mu's have to be constructed canonically, and I didn't, say, I didn't tell you anything at all about how to construct them. So uh, uh, the first uh, uh, trick is to reduce to one color. You see, these mu's are these p minus 1 multipartitions. But in fact, uh, there is a very simple procedure which allows you to concentrate just on partitions. So uh, let's say imaginary cuspidal module is said to be of color i if all words which appear uh, in it as um, with non-trivial word spaces end on i. So we always have the last uh, the last um, thing. Uh, it's not clear that such such you know reusable module should even exist so that all words in its formal character end on i. But it turns out that they do. And in fact, that for every i there is a, uh, there is a canonical again, choice of a family of irreducible cuspidal A and delta modules of color i, which I will denote by L i of mu, one for each partition of n. And when I have multi-partition, this irreducible cuspidal module L of mu bar, which corresponds to it, is just going to be the induction of these cuspidals of a fixed color. So what this does, it basically reduces to the construction of those. Okay, so next, uh, since i is going to be fixed now, we are not going to, let's, let's, uh, well, so, so now let's fix an i and let's just construct L i of mu. So this is done as follows. So we construct explicitly a certain a and delta module z and i and prove uh, that, uh, um, well, because it's, an a, a, because it's an a and delta module, of course, uh, a and delta x naturally, we get a natural homomorphism to this endomorphism algebra. So all linear maps. And the image, in other words, just a and delta module, the annihilator of this module. Let's call it SNI, and let me call it imaginary Shore algebra, because I want to take an analogy uh, with the Shore algebra acting on, uh, with GLN acting on certain tensor space, perhaps, and the image of the GLN is a Shore algebra. So in this case, I want to call this image imaginary Shore algebra. 
Um, and then uh, one proves that this module ZNI, uh, it's in fact, it's an analog of um, basically how duality. That this module ZNI is projective generator for SNI. It's projective and it's a projective generator. And moreover, one computes the endomorphism algebra, and this endomorphism algebra ends on, ends on being just the usual classical Shore algebra. Uh, in other words, it's a representation theory, polynomial representation theory of GLN uh, with uh, uh, of degree N. And of course, uh, we get a Marit equivalence um, from this. This is a Marita context, we have a projective generator. And so, a representation theory of this imaginary Shore algebra is equivalent to the representation theory of the classical Shore algebra. Those representations are labeled by uh, partitions of n, and that's how uh, that's that's a functor, Marit equivalence. And so, by applying this functor to the irreducible JLN module with highest weight mu, we can get uh, these irreducible modules Li. You know, and this is how the classification goes. Um, Moreover, this functor has some nice additional properties. For example, it intertwines the circle product and the tensor product. It's actually a tensor functor. And from this, you can, uh, you can deduce uh, the formal characters of these A and delta modules in terms of those classical formal characters of the GLN representations here. And I think I will uh, stop here. Thank you.